folks. Uh, let's get started, shall we? So, uh, good evening, everyone. Welcome to Artists Now. Many of you uh, are in this class, but many of you perhaps are attending the first visiting arts lecture or coming from anywhere on campus or across the city. So, welcome. And uh, do look online at the uh, Peck School of the Art Artists Now series for the whole schedule. You'll note that we do not have a visitor next week. But two weeks from now, uh, an artist from California, from Los Angeles, Sandra De La Losa, is coming to present. Um, really interesting work, gallery art, street art, public art, cross disciplines. Uh, she'll, she'll be an interesting night. That's in two, not, uh, two weeks. Um, so next week, my, my uh, class carries on, obviously. Uh, but tonight, we are lucky to hear and listen to James Haywood Rollins, Jr. So, I am going to introduce uh, Rena Kundu who, from Art Ed, who will introduce our guest and take it from there. Rena. African American art for children. 
in addition to 25 peer-reviewed articles and papers, nine book chapters, four encyclopedic entries, four books on the subjects of the arts, education, creativity, and human identity. As a visual artist, Dr. Rowling focuses on mixed media, explorations, and portraiture of the human condition, viewing studio arts practices as an essential form of social research. He has served on the board of directors at the National Art Education Association as higher ed division director and has been elected to serve as the commissioner at large on the new National Art Education Association Research Commission. Dr. Rowling will be the 2014 recipient of the National Higher Education Art Educator Award for outstanding service and achievement of national significance. Please welcome me in, oh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Rowling. We do the handoff. Self-imagery strewn about an ash heap 
stereotypes, which is the blurb that I sent in the advertisement. Um, we interpreted the top of the pyre of modern identity constructs, authoritative stories, and assigned names. The notion of names and labels uh, will figure very much in the story that I'd like to tell this evening. Uh, now, this notion of Cinderella. Uh, a Cinderella ending, which is a term that most of us have heard, is not really the end of the story. Rather, it's the inauguration of a new ever after. And this presentation offers a glimpse of what happens when stories of identity are unearthed as archetypes, um, as emergent and anomalous, and uh, as those that are found throughout an urban landscape. Uh, these unearthings uh, of new story, these emergent anomalous unearth unearthings of new story, allow for the displacement of rigid assumptions about Western norms that have caused countless transgressions against what I'm going to argue tonight to be the fundamental right to represent and reinterpret personal significance in the public square or in the public auditorium. So what are the implications of the Cinderella stories that emerge from the margins of our consideration? Uh, those stories that erode the center and all the certainties about its own centrality. Those stories that cause grand narratives to disintegrate and become the nuclei for new identities and practices. Uh, this is a mixed media piece uh, uh, made out of soil and clay, uh, oil pastel, color pencil, plastic. Uh, and it's representative of uh, something that I uh, want to present in terms of a human right that we don't typically think or talk about. Um, perhaps the most crucial of all human rights, the right to signify self to declare the significance of one's own life experiences, family and social networks, aspirations, beliefs, and ideas. Personal growth and human development is curtailed without the agency to mark oneself as a person that matters, to model one's personal experience to others without censorship, to make, one's, uh, to make special one's place in the world without salt, without prohibition, without desecration by those who rule or dominate. Agency, or the idea of agency, as I'm presenting, is conceived here not as the freedom to do whatever the subject wills, but rather freedom to constitute oneself in an unexpected manner, to decode and recode one's identity, especially in the face of the incomplete interpretations and misinterpretations of others. The right to visibly decode and recode personal and social significance uh, was on display during the Great Harlem Renaissance of literary and visual reinterpretations and was designated as this concept of the new Negro, where the ridiculed, stereotyped, and degraded Negro body was reinterpreted as a document of strength and beauty, yet no less black. This right to visibly decode and recode personal and social significance presents the arts and design and all manner of literary practices for generating new stories that reinterpret old stories as manifestations of the human right that I'm speaking about to represent one's lived experience. As such, Cinderella stories are always a catalyst for the reclamation of identities overlooked or neglected or buried. At first brush, um, stigma is very often internalized. We've all felt it in some way or shape or form. It becomes the human stain, whether it's racism or sexism or cyberbullying. It seems at uh, first glance that the most uh, familiar of the Western, that in, in the most familiar of the Western versions of the Cinderella story, the Cinderella fable, just by looking at the story as we've seen it in Disney cartoons or wherever. Cinderella with the flowing tresses, 
doesn't seem to be at first an apt analogy for um, the life of a man who looks like me. Uh, but the Cinderella narrative, which has been uh, found in cultures as varied as China, the Eskimo peoples, France, Germany, Zuni Indians, ancient Egypt, and Xhosa Africans, uh, is indeed more than it seems to be, uh, because it began speaking to me as a, uh, even though I'm a black man, when I was only a black child. Uh, but my desire was not to be transported from rags to riches. In fact, according to scholars of fables, um, the Cinderella ending was not a, a rags to riches story at all. I'm going to take my time here because um, I'm told I have a lot of time. And I would like all of this to sort of sink in. So this is an image uh, from, uh, uh, I think, an 1865 version of Cinderella. And she's sitting um, near in front of the uh, fireplace uh, uh, full of cinders. Um, steeped in stigma, stigma of, of her name. So I'm going to go into a little bit of uh, the significance of her name and some other variations of Cinderella's name to get at what the Cinderella ending is really all about, the Cinderella story is really all about. So Cinderella, who once worked amongst the cinders, was saved from caricature, just like I was, um, through a series of episodes and a constellation of reinterpretations. In Cinderella's case, a pumpkin is translated as a gilded coach. Mice are reinterpreted as apple horses. A rat becomes a coachman. And soot-covered rags become a jewel-encrusted gown. And when I wrote the, the Cinderella story, the book, um, my desire was merely to be transported from the assumption of tragedy, the assumption of tragedy, from the presumed disaster of lesser social privileges and to be reconciled with uh, a personal imaginary that um, might be accepted as totally okay, as totally my normal. Uh, the book, Cinderella Story, uh, employs uh, a narrative methodology uh, as a means to uh, displace uh, an oppressive bias against counter stories, counter stories which are the kind of stories that um, that resist larger grand narratives, perpetuating a kind of authoritarian order over the, their known world. Uh, grand narratives about what is, what is, and what uh, uh, what is real, and what is truth, and what is significant, um, hold great power. Um, the narrative inquiry is a kind of social research, um, which uh, is a kind of social research which, is, which offers a collaborative method of telling stories, of reflecting on stories, of rewriting stories. Narrative methodologies have been of great utility to arts-based researchers, and to critical, indigenous, and anti-oppressive researchers alike. It is, it is research that seeks not to prove or disprove, but rather to create a movement, to displace, to pull apart, to allow for resettlement. It is research that seeks what is possible and made manifest when our taken for granted certainties are intentionally shaken. In contrast, the scientific method is most useful for addressing hypothesis-based questions, guesses about what will happen given a particular set of control variables, and ultimately requiring experimentation to collect replicable data as evidence of whether the hypothesis can be disproven. Social science researchers face major limitations carrying the success of the scientific method with the physical sciences over to social research. Why? Because persons are much more difficult to understand, to predict, and control than molecules. Narrative methodologies offer researchers another approach to, education, to, uh, to educational research questions. A resistance narrative, um, a counter story, um, another, another uh, term for a counter story, um, is often critical, indigenous, or local, just as much as it's anti-oppressive. Um, in the remainder of the presentation, I'm going to tell you a story of an identity crisis, public and private, that's ameliorated um, through the renegotiation of certain narratives and namings. It's ostensibly, it'll be um, a personal story um, that I hope will um, that you'll find some connection to. But but what I do want to get across is that. 
uh, marginalized groups exist in, in shape, all shapes and fashion. And what I'm attempting to do is to give an analogy for how any group or any people um, actually moves the, uh, the, the needle in terms of names that do not fit or create misfit, right? So uh, I hope that everyone finds a connection to this. Um, resistance is necessary um, in the case of the story of African American um, identity. It has been necessary um, because of the names that have been a part of our culture. We need to be sometimes glossed over. We don't realize the names are there, but they've been in existence. They've been, they float. They, 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 uh, they linger, they stay, they persist. Um, rich, uh, vicious names, um, ferocious names, um, concepts like bad, bad, and Leroy Brown, the brutal black buck, the topsy, or buckwheat, the untamed or unkempt watermelon and chicken dinner, Uncle Tom, the smiling, wide-eyed, docile servant, Aunt Jemima, the obese, utterly contented, pitch black maternal figure, Jezebel, the uninhibited whore, uh, the denizen of all sexual fantasies. Samuel, the lazy and articulate buffoon. Jim Crow, a zip coon, the traveling darky entertainer, song and dance, dance uh, minstrel. Piola, the quadroon, self-hated, mulatto, poisoned with the scourge of black uh, Negro blood and the desire for uh, social aspirations which are just out of reach. And um, Gollywog, this one here, the grotesque alien rag doll, the antithesis of porcelain skin beauty. Now, within the, uh, the nexus of Western popular culture and visual cultural norms and ideals, African Americans have uh, been consigned to, to uh, often uh, consigned to this ghetto of social stigma, these names, these labels. But so have other groups around the globe. Um, people are marginalized everywhere, and you yourself may be part of a marginalized group. Um, so, the key question here going forward is how do you unname a name that crushes, um, that crushes you as a category that um, doesn't tell your full story? How do you unname a name that's been given, a category that um, has been forced upon you? If it were not for the storytelling, um, in, uh, in the, the story that we see uh, in Cinderella, the, the restoration of her birthright to uh, signify herself. Um, if you read the story, you'll, you'll realize there's a backstory before she uh, uh, found herself in, in that household. Um, that uh, in terms of where she came from and who her father and family were in terms of the historical narrative. Um, now for that, uh, you, you might have difficulty seeing uh, how this kind of rewriting of identity takes place, but it fortunately exists, and um, it's worth taking a look at. So uh, I would argue that this right, which you know we look at it as a fable, but it's something that extends all of us, is an inalienable right um, to decode and recode, to decode and recode. And those who cannot occupy the center along with the normal, those who lack the requisite politics or popularity or physique or speech patterns, anyone who deviates, anyone who is deemed not safe or not sensible or is too sedate or, or unschoolable, um, likewise uh, becomes stigmatized, labeled, and invalidated. And uh, we get back to this condition uh, uh, represented in this image here. So, um, uh, but once again, uh, within the Cinderella story, there's a template for addressing this indictment of inval uh, invalidity. Um, and, 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 and if I take a look at the, well, attempting, what I attempted to do in the book was to show how one reorganizes self-image um, to address the problem of the spoiled identity in both public and personal um, spheres um, for anyone who struggled with such injury. This is, um, uh, just a, a close-up of, uh, of a, a drawing um, made out of soil and clay, um, mild print, um, possible gowns, gauze, um, of 
uh, a woman named Sarah Collins. Uh, she's a survivor of the 1963 bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama, which killed four little girls attending Sunday school, uh, including her own sister, her sister, Annie Mae Collins. Um, there's a recent uh, documentary, it's in the past few years ago, Spike Lee called Four Little Girls. If you haven't seen it, see it. Um, but um, injury, the notion of injury and what causes it. Self is the site of the kind of research and practice that renames or that unnames. Um, and uh, this happens in many embodiments. Um, this is not self in the abstract, but the self as the living, breathing skin that we live in. Um, deviation and identity um, are always predicated upon narrative norms and precedents, or the battle against those norms and precedents. Nor normalcy or whatever the norm, whatever the prevailing norms that you struggle with or that you resist, or sometimes a guilty fortress that uh, uh, attempts to, 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 to keep outside or, uh, this notion of, of anything that would uh, disrupt the, the, the ongoing status quo. Uh, norms uh, exist everywhere, obviously. Um, in the United States of America, we're told is something called the American Dream, um, which is a version of the Cinderella story, uh, of the assertion that everyone has the same opportunity to rise from the ash heap. This is not quite true, and the evidence is borne out about the cycle of poverty throughout the nation or, or the world, it's replicated everywhere, um, uh, that keeps on re, you know, re, returning itself. Um, and uh, in opposition to that, uh, the, the inheritance of wealth that continues, the inheritance of status that continues uh, to cycle itself, lets you know that it's not so difficult, it's not so easy for a life to be lived as a fairy tale, uh, as a fairy tale. Um, it's, more, uh, it's more accurate to argue that there are those who discover the power of the extended reinterpretation as a means to address um, what has been um, uh, <coughs> captured and, and held aside at the day. Um, fairy tales are not normal. Uh, but propaganda does normalize, normalize, and visual propaganda is also normalizes. Um, there's a long history of um, caricatures um, about, um, in this case, African American identity. Um, if you look recently at the um, the story of what's the name of the athlete that the the, the, uh, the football player just came out as. Uh, Okay. Sam, right? Um, there's a wrestler. I just read this on just before I came in. Um, wrestler at, uh, at a, uh, a university who Kent State, I believe, who uh, started tweeting immediately um, uh, certain caricatures about who Sam is. He's never met Sam. Doesn't know Sam from Adam. But uh, but he has uh, a certain labels that were immediate at the ready because they pre-exist in the same way that images like um, uh, the caricature here pre-exist. Uh, this image uh, next to it is uh, is an example of a, of a reinterpretation, of, also of a black boy. In this case, it's a portrait that my father did of me. My father was a visual artist. Um, uh, that I appropriated, and uh, this is just a, this, uh, it's just a, uh, uh, a sample of it, um, not the whole image, but I just wanted to highlight a, a piece of it, um, drawing upon a, a, a self-portrait that my father did um, for a magazine called Advertising Techniques, and um, uh, attempting to contest what it is to be a black boy in America, um, in, a, in, a, in an America where Images like this still exist and still uh, um, attempt to to, to capture uh, and label and name. Uh, uh, this attempts to unname instead. So uh, I, I, I want to talk now about um, or tell a story um, that 
I think will give you uh, another entry point, entry, entry point into what I'm talking about. So when I was a child, um, I wasn't sure uh, how I was supposed to feel when I, whenever my mom reminded me that uh, she was in labor uh, with me for a full 20, 24 hours as I attempted to enter the world. Uh, but first, um, in other words, I was a breech baby. Is that if anyone's ever heard that term? My mother always said that um, the last three uh, siblings, I have a, a two younger brothers and a sister, uh, they, they enter the world quite easily. But um, she frankly appeared traumatized by uh, whenever she recounts my own birth. Um, and she uh, doesn't talk about it much, actually. Uh, as the firstborn of four, I was uh, thought that her, my, the lack of physical affection that I felt was some, this was just a guess, was, was a part of that trauma. I, 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 I probably totally off the base, but um, there was definitely pain that I caused her. Um, it came from being a breech baby. And so I want to use the metaphor of breech births um, for uh, going forward. Um, I grew up in a, uh, a street called Lincoln Place between Detroit's Connecticut Avenues um, in the borough of Brooklyn, New York. My neighborhood, Crown Heights, had no tree houses, but was topped by misshapen rooftops full of tin hatchways, groping TV antenna, pigeon crap, another older kids doing improper things where no one could see them. My neighborhood was what you would call bone ugly. The corner of Troy Avenue with its overcrowded, dimly lit, and very alarmingly overlarge apartment buildings was notorious for its drug trafficking. Gunshots going off at night from the rooftop, from the rooftops, and all manner of uh, incidents that people only whispered about. And when I was about 12 years old, a very fair-skinned young man named uh, Kevin, uh, bronze colored here, that looked uh, to be about the texture of cotton, was hanging out on the corner of Troy in Lincoln Place, um, and um, was shot through the head one night. He was much older than me. I was getting ready to start um, high school at the time. Uh, I went to high school art and design. Um, and he died that night. And as I remember, um, uh, that intersection uh, the, uh, the opposite intersection of uh, uh, Schenectady and uh, Eastern Parkway, instead of school, PS 167, which was an uh, elementary school that had very, very much looked like a castle. Um, the edifice was, was imposing, it was monumental. Um, uh, I had oversized rooms and windows and doorways. Uh, and it's a school that I would have attended if my parents weren't keenly aware that the quality of the education that I would have gotten at um, PS 167 was out of sync with what they hopes were for me. Um, uh, and I do also recall that there was some obscure lore at the time. It wasn't, it was sort of obscure to me, but it wasn't obscure to uh, the drug dealers on the block. Um, and that there was more penalties uh, if you were caught making sales near the school uh, than, than if you were caught further away. And so people tended to stay away, those folks tended to stay away from transactions around the schoolyard, so it was a relatively safe place to play growing up. Um, uh, simply because of that law. Um, so, the, playing in that schoolyard, several things um, became clear rather quickly. Um, you, know, you, you have to make sure that um, you know, there's no grass, there's, there's, it's all concrete, asphalt, um, make sure not to trip. Make sure to stay away from the broken shards of glass. Um, stay away from uh, the uh, teenagers doing things on the staircases. Uh, uh, stay away from uh, the homeless fellows who are um, roosted um, on, on, on under cardboard boxes on the staircases. Um, and this all goes to, to talk about the notion of the ugliness of the neighborhood. Um, but. In uh, my parents' decision to send us to, uh, to, to not have us go to the school that, we, that, 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 was, uh, uh, that I was zoned to go to, they made a choice to send us to a place called Sheepshead Bay, Brooklyn, which is, if you've heard of, if you've ever heard of Coney Island or Brighton Beach, that's pretty much where it's at. Um, and the, 
there, there was a stretch of, of uh, on the way to, uh, to Sheepshead Bay, there was a new bus there, yellow school bus, that um, it took us from our neighborhood, which at the time when I was growing up um, was um, African American, Caribbean, Puerto Rican, um, a strong sect of uh, Orthodox Jews, I mean, uh, you know, who were all black, right? Um, and took us from what had become very much of a ghetto to um, a, uh, a place where the houses had tree houses. Um, it was something that was, it reminded me very much of something that had a great effect on me when I was a kid, such so that I started off actually studying to become an architect when I was in high school. Um, that uh, uh, where the houses reminded me very much of Mike Brady's house, if you've ever seen the Brady Bunch. Right? Um, uh, and if you, you know, so it, it's hard to catalog uh, all the things that I saw along the way, but uh, you'd, saw, you'd see um, houses with backyards and front yards. Um, you'd see uh, houses with two car garages. You'd see houses with plastic swimming pools that were painted blue, sitting on the lawns with private, um, private playgrounds for children. You'd see um, uh, 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 houses with low swings, houses with uh, uh, tree houses um, swallowing their branches. So now how is it possible to have a tree house, going back to my neighborhood, uh, that doesn't have a proper tree? Uh, uh, if you, uh, my, uh, there's, a, there's this particular tree that grows in Brooklyn that's called the Atlantis uh, Altissima, and it was well known as a tree that grew very, very quickly, stunk, right? Um, it had very, very weak boughs, uh, and uh, was the opposite of the kind of place where you would build a, a, a tree house. But this was all over my part of Brooklyn. Um, and the, uh, the, I say this as a, in terms of the contrast between the two neighborhoods, um, and I want to sort of get to this notion of, of the back to this notion of ugliness. Um, this is uh, there's a book uh, that you may have encountered, Tony Morris's novel, The Bluest Eye. And in this book, there's a character named Paula Breedlove, who basically loses her mind um, out of a sense of shame, out of a sense of affliction, out of a sense that she wanted those piercing blue eyes that could outsteer the sun, out of blinking, blinking. Um, and uh, this notion of ugliness um, was in totally internalized by her in a way that, that I, I probably only avoided um, because I, I, I came to believe I was ugly. I never uh, 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 totally fully understood it, but uh, I knew that there was something about, uh, the, and I'm gonna show you an image here. Um, which sort of exemplifies it. This is an image of me um, straining not to smile when I uh, was told to do so. I pretended to be an obedient child. Um, but the reason why I was avoiding smiling is because um, it's not because of what I felt at the time um, in terms of my personal story. Um, it wasn't because of skin color. It wasn't because I felt my lips were too long. It wasn't because um, of the texture of my hair, but it's something very, very odd and something very um, internalized. Um, I only have one dimple, and if you look at images um, of what we call normal kids, either you have one dimple or you have no dimples. Somehow I internalized this notion of ugliness that um, sort of informed and gave life to a notion of ugliness that was seen by uh, seen in the popular culture, but in, in, and yet uh, had become my uh, my mantle, um, and that leads us back to uh, the notion of the Cinderella story, the Cinderella fable. Uh, one of the uh, notions that went along with the fable was uh, there were some other names that Cinderella was called. She was also called Cinder Breach. Um, it was just like the equivalent of saying cinder hind part or cinder buttocks um, as she crawled around uh, on her rear end to, to clean out the household cinders and ash from the chimneys. So where did she find her agency to 
to manage and spoil the self-image. So if we assume that identity is subject to the discourses and dialogues that, in which they're socially situated, and that discourses are, um, as is argued by uh, a scholar named Foucault, um, are practices that systematic, uh, systematically form the objects of which they speak. How does a subject, um, whether it be a, a cinder breach, or whether it's a marginalized people, uh, 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 group member, or whether it was me uh, and my inability to find my own smile, how do you visibly, visibly recode and decode and reconstitute yourself within the forms of public identity? So, The visual argument of ugliness um, is often anchored in a background premise that beauty, or at least normality, uh, originates as a display of a generally accepted appearance. Um, seeing, after all, is believing. And likewise, what is blurred or distorted, like this photograph, or merely misrepresented, is also believed. Race, similarly, is a visual argument. Um, now that we, uh, uh, what we have actually, is, if you really look at the human spectrum, is diversity. What we have is variety. Um, but the illusion of race has historically been used to justify coding um, a stigma of inferiority on those who cannot occupy the center along with those accepted as normal. Uh, lacking as they do the requisite appearance or popularity or the familiarity or uh, speech patterns or hair texture or any number of things that seem to be um, lacking. Um, as a consequence, and equal to the loss of my own smile, uh, the losers in the argument of race or sexism or classism uh, are cast in the breach as those who deviate as those who are signified as safe or insensible or too inner city or too underserved or too unschoolable or too thuggish or too niggardly. Historically, the evidence of race has been the flesh, hair, and skeleton, the skull shape. Raw data, which, which difference was first quoted as a social indictment. And we learned this early. If one of these things is not like the other, one of these things just doesn't belong. Um, that's the the Sesame Street jingle, and that's the way it goes. And we learned this early, it's, it's, it's embedded notion that if it doesn't look like, or it doesn't fit in, it doesn't belong. And we end up, once again, in this scenario. So now returning uh, to the Cinderella narrative that we know best, Cinder Breach ultimately wins her visual argument. How does she do, do that? Uh, how does she win the argument of the assignment of ugliness or of, of being a misfit? She does so by transcending the ash heap, by changing the raw data. She presents a magical gown. She presents a gorgeous, coarse-drawn coach. She presents washed skin and those sparkling glass slippers. She decodes and recodes her identity. The cinder breaches, um, are, are cinder breaches are translated to Cinderella endings, not by presenting alternative data sets alone. Uh, the warrant for the claim of ugliness, ugliness must also be subverted and its background premises undermined. Uh, the naming of a cinder breach, or Cinderella, is warranted um, by, uh, in the mind of her stepmother, if you go back to the story, um, and quoting the story, as the kindness of this pretty child made her daughters appear so odious. Um, Cinderella's kindness made her daughters appear uh, uh, awful in, in comparison. And so, uh, uh, in her effort to promote the appearance of her daughters as those nearest to polite society. This warrant was subverted near the end of the Cinderella fable when the, the feet of her daughters couldn't fit into the glass slippers. Uh, even though they were given the opportunity to do so actually before Cinderella. Uh, they were incapable, essentially, with the changing the broad da data. They were incapable of changing this, the, the uh, the bone structure, the skeleton. In other words, they didn't have access to the same kinds of reinterpretation as Cinderbreach or Cinderella as she went from breach of birth to Cinderella ending. 
Now, in the inauguration of the performance of The New Negro uh, throughout the Harlem Renaissance from the 1920s to the mid-1930s, um, the, this where there was an incomplete response in the visual argument of race. Um, it was a, a worthy start, um, uh, a change in the raw data that did not go far enough to subvert the, the, this warrant uh, for the persistent argument that black folk were or are or have always been an ugly people. Mm -hmm. Failing to fully overturn the premises of the argument against um, African Americans, the new Negro concept was easily co-opted as support for the claim that the exceptional Negro proves the rule that most African Americans are generally inferior. In the early 20th century, most African Americans were disenfranchised enough to be rendered invisible in their contributions to society, unless given a very visible platform by wealthy patrons, government work, or welfare programs, or liberal-minded and philanthropic white society. The new Negro, that concept, thus became yet another construct for the uh, the assembly of uh, a modern Western conception of African American identity, the argument which is uh, of which neither supported the idea of a Cinderella or Cinder Breach, insinuated as the archetype of beauty, nor granted the Negro a listing even in the local social register. The visual representation of the African American body in Western visual culture and commercial advertisement and paintings and popular souvenir postcards has been unique in the all out effort of those who sought to define um, African Americans either as less than. American, less than Christian, less than statistically significant. African American identity was essentially reduced to a framing device against which to define Western Europe and through which to cultivate dominant culture privileges. And so we arrive once again at the crucial question. In the matter of African American identity, or any marginalized group identity, how in the world does a breach of birth wind up as a similar story? <clears throat> the images that I'm showing you here survive um, because they were popular. They were souvenirs. They were collectibles. Uh, postcards of um, lynchings and post-lynchings. Um, advertisements of uh, products of performances, cartoons, uh, children's picture book imagery, Once again, souvenirs, postcards um, from uh, advertising estate. Sometimes they, they, they may be jokes uh, to those who traded them, but they carry, once again, uh, a sense of um, stigma and circulated that stigma. Toys, uh, postcards, um, attempts to ridicule. imagery from uh, popular liter uh, literature. Collectibles, images from popular culture, You might think that it was, um, who would uh, keep photographs of, of lynchings? But um, they were more uh, widely circulated, you may think. It was in the face of imagery like this that 
Deborah Willis, who's a, an art historian specializing in photography, makes the point that the architects of the New Negro doctrine could not um, quite naturally define the African American experience through um, through dominant culture caricatures, uh, uh, just by contesting them, just by themselves. So they, they had to be a concerted effort to find the self in visual images, um, uh, to to reposition. As a matter of fact, um, one of the first time that I encountered Deborah Willis uh, was uh, in, a, in a discussion about an exhibition that took place at the Schomburg Museum in um, New York City. Uh, having to do with imagery found you know, in typical households, uh, uh, hidden in shoe boxes, uh, uh, um, in photo albums that, was, that, that eventually began, uh, began to circulate, which posed the reality of life, of lived life, lived experiences, the, the reality of what, of the skin that we lived in, um, against and counterposed them against the imagery that you find in the popular culture. Um, the effort to find self in the visual imagery uh, brings me to um, another metaphor, example. So this is a this is an image uh, from around the time when I first began to uh, attempt to find myself again as an artist. Um, this was, I was very young at the time. Um, I went to a school called Cooper Union. Um, and this was a part of the entrance examination that they asked you to, to create a full-length self-portrait. Um, and, uh, and this effort to reinterpret self, to find the self in imagery um, that is either newly created or in count uh, imagery that's out there, floating out there, um, was also the effort that I uh, attempted uh, to put into uh, published form with a, a book called Come Look With Me, Exploring African American uh, Art of Children, which was simply uh, uh, an effort to take 10 artists who uh, worked with the idea of, uh, of renaming, of decoding and recoding lived life. Um, through the imagery that they put out there as paintings or as collages, uh, and, and talking about how this effort to decode and recode, to um, rewrites identity, rewrites identity scripts. So can identity be created from the narrative reinterpretation of identity? I would argue yes. And, uh, uh, my effort in terms of presenting all of this to you today has been to offer evidence of that. So now I'm speaking of a reinterpretive research agenda. Um, one that uh, searches for raw material in the mass media or in popular culture where new imagery and representations are inserted cut into the conversation to reveal archaeologies of identity that are at once ambiguous and anomalous, especially to the um, to the prevailing norms that are um, that tend to hold um, weight, hold hold on, and these reinterpretations can be deceivers. They can be trick players. They can be shape shifters, situation inventors, messengers and mimics of the cultural powers that be. Each reinterpretation, a work of identity, sketched out in the form of a work of art or a work of a new story. The act of locating the nucleus of new knowledge about a people group or about an individual or about a culture uh, within a margin and at first a marginalized story um, uh, and followed by the act of then insinuating that image or insinuating that new story back into the popular culture is actually a political act. It's a subversive act. And it's one that tends to the transformative potential of being on the margins. Telling the marginalized story, or the at first invisible story, the heretofore unspoken story, the suppressed or silent story, is a borderland space in both research and creative practice. Uh, these unearthed hybridities are self-representations that might mean one thing within the normalized borders of a dominant culture, 
while at the same time signifying an entirely different thing to those living in minority or marginalized communities. These reinterpretations are the self-representations of our birthright, our, our birthright that I started speaking about at the very start of this. And they allow us to teach ourselves new names in full view of those who have chosen the label or cloak in the concept of the misfit. The Yeah, telling the marginalized story, uh, whether it be in, uh, the, uh, through imagery or through songs or through words that can be set to multiply, uh, to, uh, uh, as multiple, uh, multiply uh, coded signs simultaneously present and available, yet still becoming something else, um, sets into place this notion of, of, of being able to recode uh, and makes it available to any marginalized group or any marginalized individual. So here are some final thoughts. Um, I'm an art educator. And in summation, um, this approach to agency, to the decoding and recoding of personal and public identity, is akin to the kind of curriculum making that sometimes becomes possible when an arts and design curriculum and pedagogical practices are viewed as transactional, wherein teachers' values, students' values, texts, images, interpretations, and conflicting interpretations and reinterpretations are exchanged with equal relevancy. These um, transactions happen rapidly at, a, at an urban pace, uh, like the Milwaukee metropolitan area where stories of diverse life experiences clash and compete, segregate and converge, and uh, do the kind of proximity um, to one another. Now, in 2011 and 2012, I published an article in the first chapter called Sacred Structures. Um, it utilizes the story of a, an art studio project that I did with my second graders um, at a new elementary school as they explored and engaged with architectural spaces within their community during a, a year-long study of the theme of community. The purpose of this writing was to theorize and codify some major tenets of a narrative and reinterpretive approach to both our urban arts education, um, uh, teaching, and contemporary arts practice. One that recognizes and draws upon the colliding experiences and environments and environments of urban living as an asset to the reconstitution of identity and community. So I'm going to share some of these tenets with you. Uh, and uh, if you want to go back to discussing uh, get into the question and answer uh, portion of this. If you want to go back to any one of these to talk about, you might just call them up again. First principle, the notion of uh, a 21st century uh, urban arts education pedagogy and contemporary arts practice is an expanded pedagogy, uh, extending far beyond the limited context of school classrooms and expanding, expanding the boundaries of curriculum and art making content to incorporate the social, the political, and spiritual context experienced in the lives of students and teachers within that creative community. Principle two. The 21st century urban arts education pedagogy and contemporary arts practice favors no one single canon of great works of art. In urban environments, and used as a metaphor, canons will clash and, and greatness is as relative as is the sacred. The visual culture, I, I was reminded, someone, I was reminded by the instructor that you guys had recently seen um, a, con uh, a presentation by Rick Lowe, am I correct? Mm -hmm. um, he's going to be coming to Syracuse University uh, in, I'd say, about a month and a half or so. Um, and uh, with this connection, the, uh, he obviously, as you recall, he has a very deep connection with uh, working with urban environments. And so, uh, just to continue, in urban environments, um, uh, uh, canons will clash in greatnesses as well as in the sacred. The visual culture of the urban environment celebrates and canonizes a structure as great, uh, uh, as great architecture on one day, and then erects a new tallest building in the world on the next day, all while preserving all pinnacles in one common skyline. 
principle three. The 21st century urban arts education pedagogy and contemporary arts practice recognizes that the presentation of art making is isolated. Um, as I've been present, presenting it as isolated from the influences of the surrounding mix of cultures, fails to appreciate the bizarre experiences that comprise the urban landscape. Um, principle four. The 21st century urban arts education pedagogy and temporary arts practice does not fail to overlook the innumerable opportunities to reinvent the city through new art making and design that supplants the known city with elements heretofore unconsidered. Principle five. Um, uh, 21st century urban arts education pedagogy and contemporary arts practice recognizes that new meaning is always constructed upon the footprints of prior structures, sometimes obscuring those foundations, sometimes adhering to them, sometimes adapting them, but given the density of the urban landscape, never avoiding them. Curriculum and art is not considered a thing entirely authored and initiated solely by the teacher or lone artist. Rather, curriculum is transactional. Curriculum and art contact is co-constructed by everyone in a learning collaborative as they attempt to synthesize new collective meaning. Uh, principle six. Uh, the 21st century urban arts education pedagogy and contemporary arts practices a place-based synthesis of all that encroaches upon the city's lower borders. It includes the material, the biological, the sociocultural, the geological, the geographical, and even the climatic. All that lends substance to new, revisited, or reinterpreted meaning is an asset to the future of the learning community. Uh, principle seven. Uh, 21st century urban arts education pedagogy and contemporary arts practice and values and facilitates enactments, enactments of collaborative creativity as the engine of the mutual way of welfare and asset development um, of all of all, essential for those who seek to share a city as a common home to each of the diverse inhabitants who dwell there. And finally, um, the 21st uh, century urban arts pedagogy uh, and contemporary arts practice affords students the opportunity to remake home by representing meanings proximal to their own lives and yet invisible to others, thereby prompting newfound familiarity in others to those numerous alternative ways that the city is experienced. The urban landscape reconstitutes itself by inviting its, its inhabitants, inhabitants to place, displace, and replace the signifiers that symbolize home. So what are the products of a transactional uh, art and design uh, curriculum or art making? This is a quick example. This is a um, collaborative self-portrait that I did with a student named Ian. Um, at the time, um, Ian was expressing what was on his mind. Um, uh, he was a big nature buff. Um, well, the background is entirely his own. Um, the portrait um, of him is my own. We collaborated on telling a story about the things that matter to Ian. Uh, and um, it, uh, I could not have told the story about what was, uh, what's, take, what's taking place in the background of this image. I, I could not tell that story, only he could. And I could tell the story of what I was seeing when I looked upon him. Uh, his face and his form and his shape. And so we worked together on it and without any sense of hierarchy. And as a part of the class, um, you know, I used to teach when I was um, teaching elementary schools, but um, I keep these things as indicators of the kinds of things that happen when you work transactionally. Um, I talk more about this notion of transactions, um, uh, the transactions that generate collective creativity and uh, this, uh, this book has got published in late November um, called Swarm Intelligence, um, which is a look at the social origins of creativity and continuum of exchanges that carry, as always, carry human civilization and culture forward from point A to point B. Um, and uh, with that,
variety of backgrounds that make it possible. Right? Um, so the question was um, uh, how one approaches a uh, 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 21st century version of urban arts education pedagogy. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll reflect on uh, the, the, the activity that generated those tenets and those principles. Um, so uh, at the time, as I said, we were working on a unit on community. Uh, it was a group of second graders. Um, and uh, we went to, uh, we took advantage, first of all, of the cityscape. We um, went out to see certain things. Uh, uh, certain mosques, sacred sacred structures, um, cathedrals, um, and also got students to start talking about the ideas of um, their own versions of what sacred is. And so, for some students, what sacred to what sacred to them is the idea of being in a library. Um, we, we sort of con converted the idea of sacred to the idea of a special place that um, that you use for doing something that is totally new to you that you. Um, uh, that you, that you value, and so we broke it down because we're talking to second graders, and the term sacred is, is, a, is a sort of tough term. Um, so we, uh, we allowed students to tell stories, and we tell those stories through models. Um, uh, they recreated models um, and uh, that of, of their own sacred spaces. We interviewed the students to get them to talk about those, we actually asked the students to tell about the symbols, we talked with them about symbolism, and, and got them to develop symbols that they would include in the sacred space to show that it was sacred or special to them. Um, and, uh, and then it just became a matter of transactions, because once uh, the, uh, every, every single story, every single uh, object was going to be divergent. Nothing was going to look the same, because what's sacred to me is different from sacred, but it's not sacred to, to someone else. Um, but those conversations took place in the class, and even though these were second graders, the conversations were rich. I documented all of these, made movies of each um, conversation, um, shared those conversations with parents, um, uh, presented the, the, the works in, in, in the display to get the conversation going about your kids do understand um, and have a concept of what is um, safer or special about their world, their lived in world. Uh, so, um, it, the diversity of the experiences was what made the, the, the uh, and, 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 uh, and I say this to say that it's not something that is about reinventing the wheel, it's about agency. So the fact that you have lives, lived, in experience, lived experiences that are being brought into your space, and that you allow those uh, experiences to find voice, um, allows for these uh, transactions to take place. Um, if you push ahead with uh, an idea that is Formulated where you have an expectation of what the outcome is going to be, it makes it difficult to arrive at this place. Right? Um, uh, so you know, that, that, that's the, the way I, I answer that to start. Yes. And in terms of this 
Okay, so those are good questions. Um, the, uh, the, uh, the civil rights era uh, and uh, the, 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 uh, the notion of black is beautiful, the idea uh, is exemplified in this image on the Medley magazine. Um, certainly, uh, without a doubt, uh, the, the notion of reinterpreting uh, and de recoding and, and decoding images of identity takes place. It's an ongoing continuum. It, doesn't, it didn't just take place in the Harlem Renaissance. It took place before. It took place afterwards. And it takes place now. It takes place today. Uh, the, um, so I, I uh, in the book Cinderella Story, um, which covers uh, a swath of history all the way up until today, the subtitle includes what um, it signified. And each chapter actually begins with a, what, uh, uh, a discussion uh, of what what was changed and re, uh, recoded um, with the election of uh, President Obama and what that meant. So it does carry, uh, I did talk about um, uh, a large swath of history, but I just focused uh, in this conversation on, on, um, on uh, mentioning the, the Harlem Renaissance. But obviously, it, it takes place over a continuum. I, I totally agree with you. Um, any place or any, any avenue for, for, uh, for life story, or for telling life story, whether it be on social media, whether it be um, through, um, when you say time-based media, I'm assuming you're, you're talking about film and, 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 and video. Um, there's a whole history of performance art um, that uh, 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 where uh, efforts to re-tell uh, 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 status quo stories um, uh, exist. It, it, uh, any place where a story can be told, in whatever form a story can be told, sometimes a story can be told in the form of a symbol. Sometimes a story is short, uh, is shorthand, right? So that it's not necessarily something that's written out as a text. Um, uh, movie uh, and cinema has has its own rich history of, of, of symbology uh, that 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 that. Uh, uh, and that vocabulary can be co-opted, uh, wherever vocabulary can be co-opted for any particular medium, that becomes an avenue for, for retelling a story or, re, or un unnaming names that, that um, create a sense of misfit for some group or some people or some individual. Um, so uh, I, I think we're on the same page in terms of the, the, the multiple places where stories uh, can uh, find an entry point into the, 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 the public sphere and to the popular culture. Um, I think it's fascinating, to be quite honest with you, what happens in social media when, when bits and pieces of flotsam and jetsam, so to speak, um, get pinned into uh, uh, onto a Facebook page, uh, whether it be um, you know, some sort of video from YouTube. Uh, uh, there is, um, it's fascinating how many different ways there are to tell a story. But I think one of the more important things to me as someone who has been an educator is the fact that um, it's not just a belt to tell stories. Um, um, I remember, I'm going to just cite something real quickly so I can move on to another question. Uh, uh, I, I went to the project with um, fourth graders on political cartoons, uh, talk with them about what political cartoons were, started by asking them to talk about a social, a social injustice that moved them or meant something to them, that uh, uh, something that they felt uh, compelled to to do something about. Started from there, moved to a place where to a place where they were creating their own political cartoons because we had we happened to, like I said, we did a unit on it and happened to have a, a really well known uh, <coughs> cartoon cartoons that we could bring into the classroom to sort of show a little bit about that history. But the point was. Um, the fact that kids had something political to say is not necessarily what we think of when we think of kids and what's on their mind in terms of the stories that they like to tell. Um, uh, but they tell something about them that um, that I think is important to include in the conversation. So, you know, uh, so I'll stop there. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. Well, I you showed in a couple of your pieces that you used uh, soil clay along with your mixed media. And uh, you talked about how even the materials of your work um, were components to explore that identity. 
and that kind of diversity of materials you use. Kind of yeah. Of that. So, uh, I, was, I was just going to say, can you talk a little bit about your material selection and how that actually shows up in the work? Sure. Um, so, I my background is art, and then I before I started off as a, a, an arts major in high school. Went to college to study architecture. Transferred out of architecture back into visual arts. So I did everything from calligraphy to photography to, um, um, to, to, to painting and printmaking. Did my MFA by coming into a printmaking and drawing program. Switched to a, a place, uh, to an experimental studio department where I did studio research. What was called studio research, my degree is in studio research, which is an odd degree. Might as well call it mixed media, but they were being fancy. Um, uh, so at the time, uh, what uh, I spent half my time in the library writing poetry, um, and half my time in the studio making, working with visual images and playing with materials. Um, I made the argument to my professors at the time that if uh, they were going to grade me on anything, they had to grade me on my poetry as well as my visual imagery because that was a part of my materials. I was interested in narratives and stories, and, and poetry allowed me to do that in a, in a different kind of way um, than visual imagery. Um, so at the time, uh, uh, I did start working with um, uh, making admixtures of clay, of powdered um, uh, clay, not, uh, not, not um, clay that, uh, um, that's already um, uh, wet, but um, getting the powder format and just mixing it with different kinds of uh, mediums that will allow me to do different things. I actually used to do three-dimensional portraiture. Um, I didn't show any of that here. Um, it wasn't part of the story, but uh, but I found that you can construct um, uh, soil and you can construct clay by, by by playing with the medium that you that you bound it bound it in. Um, and so um, I've been working with soil and clay for quite some time before I discovered a way to to make it work for me and to draw on top of it and to, and to work the way I like to work is very meticulously um, with layer after layer of color on top of it. So, and that, and that has been the case, you know, I can work on it with color pencil, depending on the grit of the, of the material. Um, it can be as fine, so fine that I can work on it with color pencil or to work on it with that pastel or, or, or spray paint. Uh, there are a lot of different uh, methods of working, but for me, soil was a, um, it was a, to me it was a symbol that uh, I, I started working with soil because, um, not just because I, I thought it was fascinating to have that kind of surface to draw on, on top of, but because it, um, um, it was earth. You know, and I felt it was what human beings, it was the stuff that human beings were made of. And if I were going to make portraiture, um, it made sense to make it of the stuff. You know, so I've, I've worked on sand, I've worked on um, soil and I work on clay. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> you have a question? Uh, I read your uh, presentation. Mm -hmm. uh, you were mentioning the idea of telling marginalized stories to yeah. create border uh, spaces with mm -hmm. more people who call it. Mm -hmm. um, you no, know, I was thinking we had this exhibition. So you're, talking, so you're talking about narratives as a different form of public space. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that's an interesting concept. Uh, so 
as I interpret it, um, the idea <coughs> is that, uh, so when you tell a story, it becomes a, it becomes a form for discourse. And it becomes an entry point for others to, to comment and to add to and to uh, reshape that story, or reinterpret the story. Right? So the idea that spaces, we tend to think of spaces as something that's physical, but your suggestion is that um, <coughs> space um, can be discursive. Is that, is that, is that, is that what you're Yep. Well, I think it's, um, okay, so I'll, let me connect it with something that I was talking about, which is that um, the space that's created um, by a caricature or by a, um, a, a misinterpretation of, of, of a lived experience, um, it's it, 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 it's powerful. It can become it can become a fluid. It can totally block the ability to see the whoever um, individual or group um, who they who they are and what the way they actually live because of the power of the, because of masking agents. It can become it can become a mask um, depending on its power. Um, so there's something um, um, to be said for. Uh, the kind of renegotiation that reinterpretation, reinterpretation brings in terms of changing, changing the shape of identity um, in, a, in, in a public sphere. So, you know, if you look at um, the concept that the young lady raised, the idea of that black is beautiful, right? Um, well, prior to that, black was, was most usually considered ugly or dangerous or um, uh, or, or, or something that was not um, uh, safe or something. So the idea that you could go back in and re-enter the public sphere and take a concept that was so oppressive, right, that um, that it was it filled uh, the um, you know the, what's on the screen right now is just a soup, sorry, a soapbox um, uh, that presents someone uh, uh, you know to a marketing device, but it's the most uh, it's the ugliest possible representation of. Of, of, a, of a human being, and this was common, right? So that creates a space um, for um, for argument, for contestation, um, uh, and I, I'm, I don't know if I'm if I if I'm if, if that's just my interpretation of what you're telling me, right? Uh, that these kinds of spaces um, become vehicles for um, uh, for those who are take the risk and are bold enough to do so, to go right back into the source of the stigma and to um, to use it and be appropriated uh, in a way that uh, uh, removes stigma, which is, a, you know, there's a book by um, Irving Goffman uh, having to do with the idea of the management of support of identity. How do you do that? How do you re-engage the space that has been created that, that has spoiled image and identity? Um, and um, the, the, the easy answer is that um, even though uh, uh, moments like this, moments in time, uh, are painful, they become the best place to actually begin to do that re-engagement, um, as opposed to attempting to, uh, you know, want to create something that's entirely new, to go back and revisit something that has created pain and stigma, is a powerful place to do that kind of work, that, that kind of identity work. Right? Um, so. Yes. Uh, so one thing, sort of, I mean, a lot of these images and labels are very overt, yeah. and I feel yeah. like um, as society is evolving, it's sort of becoming much more covert, and it's sort of trying to silence inequality through this guise of like political correctness and yeah. different things. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm sort of wondering through this transition, I mean, can you, can you like pre-code, you know, resilience to, to try to get people to uh, be able to challenge these labels that uh -huh. perhaps they haven't experienced or are evolving in front of their eyes? Uh -huh. um, or does that, you know, initial coding need to happen in order to, to decode 
interesting. So, so by pre-code, um, and I guess is that kind of what you're trying to do by using the, the historical examples? You know. Well, you know, there's something about the idea of pre-coding in that um, what often happens, the unconscious effect of of having seen or heard or made jokes of this, um, uh, of one uh, 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 form of stigma uh, or, or another. Um, oftentimes, pre codes us in a way that we're not aware of until we are forced to encounter it in conversation, in an uncomfortable conversation. Sometimes it happens in a course, sometimes it happens with a friend. Um, there is a pre coding that, that, that comes just by living life and having seen and having heard. Um, and having it incorporated and, um, and adopted and assimilated points of view without having been critical about it. Um, so uh, <clears throat> what happens next? Uh, uh, we're playing with the notion of pre-code versus decode versus recode. There is, um, there is, a, there is a notion, um, if you're if being really critical, oftentimes you can, all those things can happen at the same time. Um, uh, and that's what happens in dialogue. Um, whereas you, what, what happens uh, uh, when someone brings to you a, an argument that you had never considered before, or could never consider because you did not have that life experience, um, it, um, it brings their pre-codings into the, into the mix and brings their recordings um, into, into play or, or your recordings into play as you are forced to either accept or reject or, or assimilate or, um, or, um, or to, to make a counter argument, right? Um, I mean, we can play with terms, but I do think that uh, uh, the power of a form for dialogue is such that uh, uh, you know, human beings in general are not want to change their mind uh, uh, because someone else tells you or presents something to you. Uh, human beings tend to have to re uh, to choose or select, change their own minds about things. The only way you can do that is by coming into um, into uh, uh, into relationship with or into juxtaposition with ideas which you know, could not have had on their own. Um, and so you were, it's, you know, it's, it becomes messy. And I'm going to say that that word messy, uh, complicated conversation. Uh, you know, it, it, it's it's the, the opposite of what stereotypes do. Stereotypes are very easy. They're very easy because you only have to deal with a limited amount of information, right? <coughs> and you can make a judgment. You can make a name. Um, you can label something with the, with the least amount of information. So it's very very easy. The more complicated conversations are those where you are forced to grapple with. Um, uh, with things that run entirely counter to uh, uh, to what you have accepted before, or, or forced to come face to face with a life experience which is um, you just simply did not have access to before, it becomes messy. It can really, as a matter of fact, one of the reasons why arguments become so um, uh, sometimes vicious um, in political forums is that. Sometimes uh, there is the, uh, 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 the notion that someone is presenting something to you which contests with your notion of the world or life experience. It threatens identity. It actually threatens, it makes you feel like who you have believed you to, yourself to be and what you have believed about the world um, is in danger of being uh, um, uh, uh, falling apart. That becomes a very, very dangerous place, and it's why people react so um, unexpectedly, so violently sometimes, verbally, to being presented an idea about their nation, or about their politics, or about their um, um, uh, their, their, their conception of, 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 of themselves, when you, you, know, you don't expect you don't expect sometimes that kind of blowback, but it happens all the time. And it's because we tend to feel that kind of threat. So it, it, all I, I'll say there is that it's, it's, it's a messy prospect, but it's, it's an important prospect for those kind of complicated conversations. Um, I'll also say real quickly that 
uh, there's a fellow named William, William Pinar who talks about curriculum uh, as complicated conversation. Um, and the idea that you, uh, um, that the curriculum for uh, any, any, for any particular disciplinary study um, comes not from a book that's given from on high, but actually comes from the live experiences that are coming into context uh, and contiguous into uh, uh, contiguity with one another. That is that's where the real curriculum takes place. That's that's where the rubber meets the road. Um, and you need to have this kind of um, the, the mess of that of those conflicts coming into uh, relationships with one another. So just a just some thoughts on that notion of decoding. Okay. Yeah. So how do you feel when um Sure. The last question. So how do you feel when these kind of references are used in major entertainment? So just for like example, like the movie Django that came out last year, or mm -hmm. the popular show The Pell Show, where it kind of takes stabs at every race mm -hmm. and they stay up. Do you think that kind of perpetuates the problem or it kind of juxtaposes it so much that it makes it more comfortable to address? Well, you know, um, it goes back to the notion of messiness. You know, so there are people who will take the same movie, Django and Chain, and react to it as if it's an offense, as a slight. Um, so people within the same community can find that movie to be something that is liberating and um, and uh, 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 a breath of fresh air, right? Um, and that's based on life experience. It's based on um, you know, it would be easy if everyone responded the same way to, 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 to that film. But, um, but I think it's totally appropriate that um, some folks attempt to take concepts that are, that have, and, and, and re, and, and cast them out again in a, in a different format. I don't think it matters at all that uh, Tarantino is white or black, um, uh, in the sense that um, it's, Everyone, whether you're white or black or Latino or, or whatever your, uh, uh, your your background, you've all everyone has come face to face with those uh, stereotypes, and it has to it has to make sense of them. So the fact that you made some sense of it in one way and I made sense of it in a different way, um, um, that's that's about being human, right? So I I can't I can't you know. Personally, and as we end, I know we have, that's the last question. Um, I can't, I don't feel like I can say um, legitimately from my point of view that, uh, that someone else's interpretation is wrong. No, I think that is their interpretation. Um, I can interpret it differently and I can reinterpret their interpretation. You know? So it becomes a place where people now can come together and then now riff off of Django and Chain. Um, and someone can do a follow-up movie that can test it, that argues the point, uh, becomes another place, another site of the station. Uh, so more of it is, as far as I'm concerned, the better. Um, 